Uh, we are starting the book of Hosea tonight. We're gonna we've got a few notes here, and we need a little bit of background, and we'll probably do some more review or introduction next week. Uh, but I'm gonna look right here, just start here in the book of Hosea, chapter one, verse one, and read the first verse, which kind of sets the history behind it. It says, the word of the Lord, and then you see that's Yahweh, that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of, now these are the kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. So he gives you four kings of his, or Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and one king of Jeroboam. Now, his ministry, you can see Jeroboam, 793 to 753, falls into this area of Uzziah. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're overlapping. And it goes all the way down into the, or at least beginning of the reign of Hezekiah, which is 715. We could easily say maybe 710, you know, as just, we don't know how long. But you can see there's a lot of time between 753 and 710. And so there's a whole list of kings from Israel that are recorded that were kings of Israel and he would have been active during their reign, but he does not mention any of those kings. He doesn't put them in there. It's not listed here. Uh, and again, who wrote this opening line? Again, you can know that Hosea uh, began in verse 2. And when Hosea is, Hosea is doing one of two things, he's either just speaking out these prophecies or he's writing them down or doing both. And so I think we can assume, I'm, I'm going to present the book, that he's making announcements, but he's also writing these things down, uh, like many of the prophets, or has a scribe working with him. That this first verse is probably the editor that put the book together that tells you this is when his ministry was taking place. These are when these prophecies occurred. It would just make sense that someone would put that in there. Um, but it's interesting that they skip these kings that are all listed right here. Uh, because after Jeroboam II, his son, uh, Zechariah, is, is going to reign for only six months. And one of the themes that we're going to see tonight is the, the message at, in Jeroboam's days, final days, or in, during his ministry sometime, is that the house of Jehu, and Jehu would be Jeroboam's great-grandfather, and you can see on your notes, uh, the second bullet, or the, the information right below what I've got written on the board, is the four generations of Jehu's dynasty. Jehu, Jehoahaz, Jehoash, who's mentioned in the introduction here, and then Jeroboam the second. What, they reigned 28, 17, 16, and 41 years. And one of the first prophecies is that the house of Jehu is going to come to an end. And that Jeroboam the second son reigns for six months, and then he's assassinated, ending... Jehu's uh, four generations of uh, di dynasty. And then there's a series of several assassinations, several, several assassinations in the rest of Israel. Uh, Tiglath Pileser setting up his own king in Israel. There's the pro Assyrian group, there's the, the faithful Israelite group, then there's probably on the other side of the Jordan River the Gilead uh, king that's set up. So there, there, it's, it's kind of like where our country's heading, where you're going to have, you know, the, the, the group, this group's pro this country and pro this country. Then there's a, a deep state or a sub-state somewhere within the mix, and it's just, it's just deteriorating very quickly after Jeroboam's time. Uh, then Israel's going to fall in 722. So Jeroboam died in 753, and then 30 years later, after 30 years of chaos, Israel's destroyed, Samaria falls. Now, maybe the reason these kings are listed here is because uh, Hosea was still ministering during this time period. But and after 722, he's no longer in northern Israel. Uh, we would assume he go, he's going to flee into Judah like many people did, fled to Judah. He may have fled earlier. I, we don't know. It's many details we don't know. But this may be... Uh, it is interesting that he's a prophet to Israel, the northern tribes, but yet they list the kings that he was ministering, which gives the impression that the people of Judah kept his writings, and maybe the person that gave this introduction, this introductory verse, or that it kept these books and edited and, and put them in order of his writings, they're from Judah. And that's where he would have ended up, that's where they were recorded, 
uh, or, or uh, uh, assembled it would look like, and there is mention of Judah throughout this. In fact, Judah is warned, don't be like your sister. And so remember, Hezekiah, we just got finished with Micah. Hezekiah listened to Micah and took action. He's also got fleeing down into his country during this time, or having fled from there, uh, uh, Hosea and, and his writings and his own presence. And so a lot of the revival you've got taking place in Hezekiah's day may have been a result of watching this, Hosea coming, having these words here, uh, along with Micah. So that's, that's what we see. Now, as far as how long did his ministry last, uh, the bullet points that we've got down here kind of gives you an impression of there. Uh, it says, well, okay, I just read this. Hosea 1 4 uh, is a prophecy of the end of Jehu's dynasty that, that was fulfilled in 752 when Zechariah died. And it also talks about the end of Israel falling in 7, 722. So some of these prophecies are going to take place during Jeroboam's time and then afterwards. Uh, the next bullet point, Hosea prophesied in the final days of Jeroboam the second beginning about 760. So we've got the, the biggest range you could have of, of his ministry would be beginning in 793, you know, if he began in the very early days of Jeroboam, going all the way to 686, uh, the end of Hezekiah. So you can see that's, that's a, you know, a hundred and some years. That, that would be the maximum. Uh, that, that he'd be an active prophet. He's, that's when these prophecies take place. That's not counting the fact that he had to grow up as a boy and then probably his last few years as an old man. So we're talking about a man that's you know, 130 years old with a ministry of you know, 110 years or something. Now, that means this is probably not correct. So you've got to figure out he probably ministered during the final days of Jeroboam and then you can pick a time. And I think on here I wrote down uh, 760. If he began prophesying in 760 B.C., that means he was active for seven years during Jeroboam's time. Again, this date is an estimate. It's sometime during Jeroboam's ministry, sometime during Uzziah's, not ministry, but during these, these kingships. So say 760, and he continued down into Hezekiah's reign. And so that's why I say 710. Because, again, he's, he's going to be there for a while. How long? Maybe, maybe 705. We don't know. But right here, 760, if he's going to get seven years in Jeroboam's reign and continue into five years into Hezekiah's reign, 710, you've got a 50-year ministry that these chapters were pronounced, recorded, and, and Hosea is going to be living. And now, that's important to understand because these first three chapters are going to be as personal information we've got. They're about his personal life, his marriage, and his first three children being born. And that whole thing could take place in a matter of maybe seven years, figure. You know, seven to ten years. So out of a 50-year ministry, the first three chapters are going to talk about maybe seven to ten years of what's taking place. That gives him, let's say ten years, that gives him ten years of his personal life that is going to become representative of the rest of his ministry for the next 40 years. So you could have 10 years of his personal life being recorded here in the chapters 1, 2, and 3, and that's going to set the stage for his main message for the next 40 years. An entire generation will be hearing it, giving you about a 50-year ministry. Again, 760 is not certain. Uh, let's make it the, the least if it's... Uh, Jeroboam dies in 753, so we can say 754, and Hezekiah begins reigning in 715. So there you've got, let's say, 755, that makes it easier. Now you've got 55 minus 15, you've got what? That's 40 years of uh, ministry. So the, and that's ridiculous, because now you're talking about a few months in Jeroboam's reign, a few months in Hezekiah's reign, 40 years. So the shortest his ministry could have possibly been is 40 years, and that's too short. 50 years seems to be a reasonable amount. So that kind of gives you an impression of how long Hosea was prophesying. Not how long he lived, but how active he was, and that his ministry would have ended most likely in Judah because uh, Israel fell and he's going to have to flee. Now, when he fled, we don't know. Kind of gives you a perspective. And I got all that information written down. Uh, the second bullet point from the bottom there, a good estimate of time for Hosea's time as an active prophet would be 760 to 710 B.C. Uh, and according to chapter 1, verse 1, 
uh, the, the minimum length would be 38 years, 753 to 750. Now, there you've got a box or a picture, the diagram that I drew, and I just updated it. Uh, I, there's a, it's on, on, on the internet or on my, or my drawing page, my, my program I use, it's in color, and there's a yellow box, it's kind of a gray. Can you see the grayish box over Hosea? That you can see it's overlapping in the Jeroboam train where it says Israel, the king of Israel. Can you see that? Is that okay to see that? You can see it's overlapping Jeroboam. And then it continues and go covers. Oh, those are all your kings there. After Jeroboam, you can see his son Zechariah, who is going to die after six months, followed by Shalem, Mahaniam, Pekahiah, Pekah, and then the final king, Hoshea. Uh, that's Israel, then it falls by the end of the Assyrians. And then down below, right below that, you get the kings of Judah. You got Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and then Hezekiah. So those are that's the, the overlapping of the kings. So right above that, you can see he would be a prophet during the the reign of uh, Asher Dan the third, Asher Nari, Tiglath Pileser, where he rebuilds, basically rebuilds Assyria. So Hosea is prophesying during the glory, the end of the glory years of Jeroboam. And again, we talk, this is the days of Amos, who's a minister from Judah, going up into uh, Israel. And the, this is a time of great prosperity, because Assyria is on the decline, Syria's been defeated, uh, and so we know this, Jeroboam in the north is, is very prosperous. They control the trade routes. Uh, and so Amos is prophesying, Micah is prophesying, at some point, Jonah is going to come out of here and go prophesy to Nineveh. We've talked about that, 759. And then Hosea is in here during this whole time, say seven, uh, you know, 760. So he's, there, he's there when Jonah's there. He's there at the end of Amos. He's overlapping with Micah. And Hosea is prophesying that, like Amos and Micah were, that things are going to deteriorate very quickly. And it's hard for anybody to believe that because they're in Jeroboam's reign. Right after Jeroboam dies, Zechariah, his son, is executed, is assassinated, and then chaos sets into the northern kingdom. Hosea continues to minister, prophesy to those times. 722, uh, Israel falls, and Hosea would have then come down, moved into Judah, and continue to prophesy during that time period. And so you can see that he's going to be there during Asher Dan the third, looking at the Assyrian king. Asher Nari the fifth. That's after d days of Jonah, and they're, they've de de deteriorated. Their 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 empire has collapsed, but they're starting to rebuild. And then Tiglath Pileser, or they're repenting. Tiglath Pileser comes up, restructures everything in Assyria, and they become a world power again. Hands it over to Shalmaneser the fifth, who begins uh, controlling Israel, setting up kings in Israel. And he dies during the destruction of Samaria. Who hands it over to Sargon II, and, and Israel now is defeated, and Assyria is a world power controlling the whole map of the Middle East. And then, of course, there's Sennacherib coming, and now we're into the days of Jeremiah, uh, you know, Isaiah after that, and Jeremiah coming. So, anyway, that's kind of the time period you can see right there um, that uh, Hosea is going to be ministering. Uh, I turn the page. Here's the basic outline of the book with the with with the 14 chapters that we're looking at right here. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of an overview on this just so you get a feel for what's taking place. And it's there's a couple of things I want to present tonight. Um, but the first three chapters, like we said, these this is personal information. Uh, is, and again, what, what's going to take place in this book, you're going to have Hosea is going to be married to Gomer, they're going to have one, two, three children. A boy, a girl, a boy. And uh, if you want time periods on this, uh, they would usually nurse for two years. And so there's easy to say, this is the ancient world, two, even longer, maybe two or three years that they'd be nursing. So they're, they're probably two years apart. That's two years, two years, two years. And then you're going to have a time here. Uh, these two are going to get married. And we're going to talk about Gomer. She's going to be an unfaithful wife. Now, the questions that we're going to see that's coming up here, um, about in middle page two, 
is this marriage hypothetical? Is it just an allegory? It really didn't happen? That's one, one line of thought. I disagree with that. We'll look at it. One, it's a literal marriage, and Gomer's unfaithful that she was a prostitute, that, that Hosea married a prostitute. And there's people that would accept that. That's not bad. There's, there's room for that. Uh, that. That's another belief. Another idea is that she was unfaithful, not as far as morally. She was spiritually unfaithful. She was not following Yahweh. She was a follower of the idols. And so she was an unfaithful wife uh, because the word, you know, unfaithful, uh, uh, like a prostitute, can be uh, a moral, you know, morally wrong sexually, or it can be referring to spiritual. Some people, there's, there's going to be that group that says she was an idol worshiper and he married an unfaithful Yahweh worshiper. Or... And this is where I come down right now. Again, I'm going to teach the book, and you know when you teach a book, I know when I teach a book, I can start at the beginning and have some ideas, and as you grind your way through it, you know, you're like, it's like sanding wood. You know, the more you sand, the more you work with it, the smoother it comes, the clearer the grain comes out. And uh, sometimes it looks different when you get done working with it. And so when I get down with this book, I may, mm, I don't know. What I think right now is Hosea married a woman who was not a prostitute, but in the process of their marriage, she became unfaithful, and she is going to leave, uh, she's going to become a prostitute, and then in chapter 3, uh, he's going to go get her because he actually loves her. Uh, he's going to go get her, you're going to see him buying her back, and she's going to come back and live in his house. So in other words, what I'm going to present, and you do not have to accept this, I'm still making decisions, that yeah, she became a prostitute. Chapter 3, she, he's going to go get a prostitute, but it's his wife. That when he marries Gomer, she is not a prostitute. She's, they're going to get married, and she's going to become a prostitute. She's going to have a spirit of unfaithfulness. The reason that's important in chapter 1, 2, and 3 is because... And again, you, you're going to be able to decide. Uh, we'll go over some stuff. You don't have to, I'm just telling you what I think right now. I disagree. Okay, fine. That's good. Healthy. I might disagree too. But what you have right here is this is supposed to be an illustration for the people of Israel of what their relationship is between Israel and uh, Yahweh. I mean, right this way. Yahweh and Israel. And the ideal was that Yahweh chose Israel and she was faithful, you know, the wilderness, the whole thing. He brought her, took care of her, got her into the land, and she's going to prosper. Uh, and they're going to have, you know, a family. They're going to have their, their life together. But Israel's going to go astray. She's going to become an unfaithful worshiper. She's going to become a prostitute following the idols. But God is going to go get Israel and bring her back. And so this book is going to be about Israel. They're going to be being ripped. They're going to be condemned throughout this book that Israel has been unfaithful. They are going to be punished because they've been unfaithful. But throughout, and it's, 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 there's no doubt about it. It's for sure. It's not like maybe unless you repent. It's like you are going to be punished. I no longer love you. I no longer care. I'm going to punish you. But at, at the end, throughout the book, there's always going to be in the future... I'm going to come get you. And that's exactly what happens here. You've got a husband and a wife. There's going to be a time where the wife is going to become unfaithful, leaving everything that she had. And she's going to be gone into prostitution. And uh, Jose is going to go get her and bring her back. And that's exactly what takes place in their life in a matter of about seven years. What's going to take place in about seven years, seven to ten years, what's going to take place is going to be an illustration of exactly what happened. God chose Israel. He was faithful. She was faithful. She leaves him. She gets punished. He goes out and gets her sometime in the future. This future event is still in the, in the future. This has not happened yet. So that's kind of what this is. It's an illustration of what's taking place. And the key for me, if Hosea is going to be living this life in Israel, for the people to see. They're going to know about it. They're going to know all about this. It's, it's right here. And they're watching it. And he is not just acting. This is the thing that, that 
he's not just doing a spiritual act. He's not just living out a prophecy. It's like, like Jeremiah, he went around naked for a while because you're going to go into captivity. Or Isaiah went around naked for a while because they're going to go into captivity. They're, they're acting out certain things. They're, they're not really this way. They're just acting. Hosea is not acting something out. He actually loves Gomer. Gomer, he loves her. He marries her, has a family with her. She leaves him. And he goes out and buys her back and brings her back. And everybody's going to be have, you know, watching him, feeling, I don't want to you know, get too emotional with it, but you know, feeling sorry for him, understanding him. Oh, how do you with Gomer? And he goes off and he goes, gets her, brings her back. What love, what love Hosea has for Gomer. And the whole point is, exactly, this is God's love for you. You have gone astray. What Gomer did is what you've done as a nation. Now you feel sorry for Hosea. That's how you should be feeling about God. He's the one who brought you. He's the one who's going to come back and get you. You are, the, you are Gomer. If you feel sorry for Hosea, say, why did Gomer do that? Why are you doing it or for Israel? Why are we doing it? Why am I doing it? Come back to God. So if it's anything, if it's in the media, if it's in the tabloids, if it's all in the news, you know, whatever, people say, well, you know, what about this? It's like, this is actually you that is Gomer, and God is like Hosea coming to get you. When you feel sorry for Hosea, feel sorry for God. And anyway, that's, I think, a very strong argument for what I presented. Now, here we go. Uh, uh, some just again the, the above uh, on page two at the top the basic outline of Hosea chapter one through three is personal and we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight and then we'll go back eventually go through all the verses then chapters four through fourteen are going to be prophecies that are going to come over this period of some forty to fifty years of prophecies and there's it's real hard to there's no dates on these. The best thing we've got going for us is chapter 1, verse 1 of when these things take place. It's clear Israel has not fallen yet because they're told they're going to fall. It's clear Jeroboam is still the ruling class, uh, the dynasty, because they're told that his dynasty is going to end. But as we go through, because he goes all the way to Hezekiah's time, all those things take place and Hosea is still prophesying. And probably so Judah will listen. Judah's going to be the one that's saved. And so we'll look at chapter 4 through 14 in a little bit. But going back to chapter 1, let me read chapter 1 to you so you can kind of hear this. Well, let me read the notes here first. He's going to have three children. One, two, three children. And they're all going to be given names. And the names of the first one is Jezreel. And it has to do with this word Jezreel. It sounds like Israel. And that's the thing that the prophets would use is words that sounded the same to make an illustration, but it's going to tie heavily into the Jezreel Valley, the, you know, where it, it, what we call Armageddon, or uh, 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 where the city of Jezreel's at, it's, it's uh, uh, well, the Jezreel Valley. Uh, and that's where the, the war is going to take place, and that's where the Jehu's dynasty is going to end. And so there's going to be a battle, and that's what the first child's name means, is, well, chapter 1, uh, verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea the prophet, the, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness. Now again, that's a key, key verse right there that sets you up. He's going to marry an, an adulterous wife. He's going to marry a prostitute. And that could be, or else he's going to marry a wife who's going to become adulterous. In other words, he's telling you, you're going to marry this woman, and here's what's going to take place and the children of unfaithfulness. In other words, you're going to have children with this woman. We'll talk about the details of this verse later. Because, And here's why. Because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord, from Yahweh. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Here's, here's the first child. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel. Because I will soon punish the house of Jehu, that's that four dynasties I showed you, ending with Jeroboam and his son Zechariah being killed, for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And again, Jezreel, Israel, they play on each other. And there's, okay, in that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. So there's several things taking place there, including Jehu's original 
execution of all of Ahab's family. Remember when Jehu came riding in with the wild chariot after having been anointed on the other side of the Jordan Gilead? He came riding in and he has, uh, 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 what's their name? Uh, the wicked queen Ahab and uh, Jezebel throwing down Ahab's. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, Ahab's family's killed. And, and all the sons and everyone, and so the whole family's wiped out. That may have been extreme bloodshed. He was trying to get rid of Baal worship, very violent. And so that may be something that's going to play into this uh, that, that's still carrying over into the fourth generation. I mean, it just kept declining, nonetheless. Then, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Hosea, oh, okay, wait, wait, verse 6. Gomer conceived again. And again, we're going to assume that's about two years later. Gomer, and that's what some people are critical of this because it's like, how is anybody getting anything out of this? They, he marries Gomer, and then, you know, within the first year sometime, they have a son, and then two years later, they have a daughter, and two years later, they have another son, and all this comes together with a meaning. Who, who's paying attention to this? And some people say, well, that's why it's got to be just a story. It's just symbolic, but nonetheless. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Rahama." And the word lo, and this we'll talk about this, Lo is equal to the word no. It means negative. It nullifies. Like we have like ah in the Greek. Ah, uh, millennia. It's nothing. It, it, it's the opposite. Call her lo rama. You can see right there. Uh, it means love. It means not loved. And meaning he calls his daughter not loved. And that's exactly what it means in the Hebrew. For I will no longer show love to the house of Israel... Uh, that I should at all forgive them. In other words, I'm not going to love them, I'm not going to forgive them. So the first thing is, the house of Jehu is going to be destroyed, Israel is going to be destroyed in the valley of Jezreel. I no longer love Israel, I no longer am going to forgive Israel. Those are the names of his two children. Now two years later, oh hey, we should see this verse 7, yet I will show love to the house of Judah. See, that's interesting because this is talking about Israel, not Judah. I'm drawing a line because now Judah is going to get into a wave of repentance. And I will save them, not by bow or sword or battle but by, or by horse, but by the Lord their God. So remember, the Assyrians are going to be the ones that come down and destroy Samaria. And then they're going to continue down into Judah. And they're just going to continue their expansion. And Samaria is no longer loved. They're not forgiven. You will be destroyed. But I will still love Judah. And I will deliver Judah. Not by horse. Now he's talking about the day of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. In other words, early in his ministry, he's prophesying that Judah is not going to suffer the same fate as, as Samaria. And, and it's going to actually take place eventually in 701 B.C. And of course, Hosea's book, along with Micah, along with Isaiah, may have helped set the stage for Judah's repentance where they were delivered, at least the city of Jerusalem was delivered. But right there, there it is. Um, verse 8, after that, she, uh, after she had weaned Lo Rahuma, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people. And of course, there's a word Lo again, no, not. And Ami, you can see down there in the footnotes, means people or my people that you are not my people, and I am not your God. I don't love you. I'm not going to forgive you. You are not my people, and I am no longer your God. I'm handing you over to something else. And so those are the names of his first three children, uh, all judgment. So Gomer is going to produce three children with names of judgment uh, that, uh, I mean, I mean, they're, they're I don't want to say comical, but, you know, here, what's your child's name? Not mine. Not my people. What's the name of this one? Not love. I don't love this one. Not my people. And Jezreel's going to be destroyed. It's like, and where's your wife? She left. Well, it's like, well, obviously you didn't name your kids like this, but nonetheless. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand. Now here's the positive side of all. There's always going to be that. Yet, my, yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. 
in the place where it was said to them, now this, here's Romans, you can hear Romans right here. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The very place where God says, you are no longer my people, he's going to say, ah, the day is going to come where I will say, but you are the children of God. Now, Paul is going to take that in Romans, and he's going to talk about that being the Gentiles, in a place where they were not the people of God, because Israel was the people of God, not the Gentiles, but it's going to change, and eventually the people that were not the people of God, the Gentiles, they'll be called the children of God. And so that's going to play into this. There's, a lot, there's something to be said again, the Calvinists and the Reformers and the predestination crowd wouldn't accept this, but I, I, I see it right here, and again, this may be my ignorance, but it's like, if you're chosen, you're chosen. And that never changes. But here you've got God's chosen people, now are not chosen. But, someday you will be chosen. And so, that's what he's doing there with Israel. But in, in Paul's illustration, Israel was chosen, and the Gentiles are not the people of God. But Israel's going to be rejected and no longer chosen. And the, the ones that are not chosen, they're going to be the chosen ones. It's like, well, now how does that defend Calvinism? It's like you're, you're, the very chosen ones are losing their choosing. And they're even switching. In other words, it all comes back to his, is their relationship with Christ. When Israel rejects Christ, he rejects them. When they respond to Christ, he accepts them. It's like, are you chosen or not? It depends on how you respond to Christ. The chosen are in Christ. So anyway, it's kind of a, again, if you're Calvinist, that makes no sense because nothing makes sense. It's like being at an impeachment hearing with, you know, Adam, whatever his name is. I don't even want to say it out loud because I hear it so many weird ways that may say something inappropriate. But uh, anyway, it's like, it, it, that's the way they see it and you're not going to change their mind. Same with, with Calvinists. It's like, and they may be right. Democrats are or the Calvinists, all right, but nonetheless, we will now. Oops, I just got political. Shouldn't have done that. Okay, here we go. That's the end of chapter two, right there, uh, where it says uh, verse eleven or chapter one, verse eleven. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited, and they will appoint one leader. There's the Messiah, and will come up out of the land. For great will be that day of Jezreel. Uh, that's the regathering. That's in the distant future. That's exactly what you saw in Micah. Micah was talking about that the whole way through. Was there's the now, and then there's the future, and we are still living in this place right here. The now was going to be the judgment was going to begin. They're going to be driven from the land, and they're going to be gone for a long time. But sometime in the future, they are going to be brought back. They have not been, that did not include the Babylonian return, that did not count 1948 return. This is talking about the return when the Messiah brings back. We are living, the, the, the Babylonian return happened here, the Roman destruction happened here, the 1948 return happened here, if you want to count all that. We're still in this time, living between the Assyrian destruction and the time when the Messiah restores them. Hosea is talking about the same thing right here. He's, they're going to be judged here, and it's going to begin a period of judgment or disassociation, which will not be ended until Jesus or the Messiah returns and restores them. A lot of things are going to happen in this time period, but it is not the restoration of Israel. They will be restored, restored when God is doing something in this time period. It matches a Micah. It matches in Hosea. Okay. Now, chapter 2 is a long, and you can see in the notes right here, chapter 2, Israel is unfaithful, and it talks about Israel being unfaithful. It's the longest chapter. It's, it's the longest chapter in the book. It just keeps talking about how unfaithful she is. In verse 2, rebuke the mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. It almost appears in chapter 2, if anything is happening in, in, in Hosea's life, Gomer is having problems. Now, God is addressing Israel in this chapter. Throughout this chapter, God is announcing Israel's rejection, Israel's unfaithfulness. But as you get into chapter 3, you're going to find out that Gomer has left. Gomer has gone away. She's off into prostitution. She's off uh, being unfaithful. She's been with many men. 
Uh, and that's, that's Gomer. That's where we get to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 2 is, seems to be addressing Israel as an unfaithful wife, but as I present this and we get into it, it's almost like Hosea is watching his wife act just like God is watching Israel act. They both got the same problem. Yahweh and Hosea both have the same problem. Hosea is living the nightmare that God has been experiencing for years in his own home. And so that's what you see right there. It's the longest chapter. And it may be that she's running off. Now, chapter 3, verse 1. That's, that's the end of chapter 2. Chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Now, if there's one man or if there's many men, we'll talk about this as we go. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods, plural, and love the sacred raisin cakes. Now, again, that's going to have to be in context. What is the raisin cake? That's something they're offering the, the false gods. It means nothing to us. You know, you don't, if they have raisin cakes at Thanksgiving, don't say, oh, whoa, whoa. It's no, it's no longer an issue, but for them it was some kind of ritual with the foreign gods. And so in chapter 3, God is telling Hosea, go find your wife and love her like I love Israel and bring her back like I'm going to bring Israel back. And so Gomer is not interested. And again, notice right here, Hosea loved, loves, is, is emotionally connected to his wife. And he's got every reason... Uh, now again, according to the, well, I don't want to get into that right now. I was going to, according to the law of Moses, if a, a man divorces his wife and she marries somebody else and he divorces her, this man, we just read it last night, this man can't marry her again. And so I don't think, we're going to get into this, I don't think he divorced her or gave her a certificate of divorce. I think she left. I think they're still married. I think he's still wearing his wedding ring. And she's over here and he's trying to figure out how to get her back. And now God says this, verse Chapter 3, verse 2. So I brought her, or I bought her. Hear that? I bought her. I mean, she's your wife. What are you buying her for? I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. Translation real quickly. You're supposed to, you're going to live with me and you're not going to leave anymore. You're to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute. See, and again, that would indicate that she's been with many men. Or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. Again, there's a courageous man right there. But what he is doing is the same thing. His wife has acted towards him like Israel's acted towards God. And God is going to come back and get Israel. You're going to live with me for many days, and you're going to walk away and forsake all others. Now, Hosea, you're going to do the same thing to Gomer so everyone can see your love for Gomer. And what they're going to see, they're going to know. Maybe some of the men know what Gomer's been doing. They've been with her. And they're going to see Hosea's love and his willing to take her back. And he's going to go out of his way and say, that's how God feels about you and what he's going to do with you in the distant future. Now, this whole... now some... Now, some, again, I'll just throw this in here. Chapter 3, verse 1. So the Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another. So, and again, different translations, that Gomer's long gone. Gomer left, had the kids, and left him, and she's long gone. And now he's got to go marry a prostitute. So in other words, he's, he's on his second marriage to a second woman. Some people think that's, the, and again, that, that could be it. That these are two different, some people, they're two different women. I think chapter 1 is about them coming together and having a family. Chapter 2 is about her leaving like Israel. Chapter 3 is about him going and getting her back like God is bringing Israel back. I think it's the same woman. I think it's a parallel. But again, we'll talk about that when we get through all these verses. And then verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince. What are those many days? That's that box that grew right here after the Assyrian dispersion. They'll live many days. That means years, centuries, millenniums without sacrifice or sacred so why, why, why are they not sacrificing on the temple mount of the day? Because of this verse right here. It's like the ark never came back. They had some kind of ritual set up, but that's been destroyed. They have no sacrifice or sacred stone without ephod or idol. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord or Yahweh, their God. We see it throughout the Bible. 
uh, throughout the prophets that the Lord, the Israelites are going to see something, they're going to understand something, and they're going to return to the Lord. They're going to seek the Lord. Zechariah says they're going to seek the one they pierced. Uh, their God and David the king. And remember, Mike, how often the Messiah and David were connected. When the Messiah comes back, David's going to be there. So they're going to seek Yahweh, their God, and David, their king. And again, that may just mean the lineage of David, or it may mean a resurrected David is now back in place. They'll come trembling to the Lord and to his blessing in the, there it is, the last days. And that's a, a, a typical phrase, almost a technical term for the end of time, the end of day before uh, God sets up his kingdom or when he sets up his kingdom. Okay, so that's chapters 1, 2, and 3. That's the personal uh, information about Hosea. Now, chapter 4 through 14 is just prophecy after prophecy, illustration after illustration. There's a couple of times we can take and we can read what's going on and we can maybe grab an event in history where, where someone dies or someone invades, uh, possibly. But otherwise, these are somewhere during that 40, 50 year period of just information that's being dumped out there. Uh, it makes sense to us. We can make sense, you know, and, and learn from it. But where, whenever, whenever it was delivered, those people would have known exactly what was taking place. And here it is. We won't read through these things, uh, but he's going to rip on the leadership. He's going to rip on the, the priest. He's going to rip on uh, the people. And how, well, here it is. Uh, look on page two. Point two under the basic outline of Hosea, the prophecies. Chapter four through five, Israel is unfaithful. It's going to address Israel as being unfaithful, but it's going to also identify some groups. Like for example, chapter five, verse one. Hear this, you priests, pay attention, you Israelites, listen, O royal house. So they're addressing the priesthood, they're addressing the general population, and they're addressing the royal household of, of Israel. And then talks about all the things they've done. And again, the word prostitution is going to come up often. Uh, Israel is unfaithful. That's chapter 4 and 5. Chapter 6, Israel will come back to Yahweh in the last days, but will be punished in the, now in the days of Hosea. So that chapter, chapter uh, 6 is talking about now and the future. In the future, they're going to be restored. Things will be okay. But right now, you're going to be punished. And you're not going to be forgiven. We're going to drag you into captivity and punish you. But the day is coming in the distant future... Again, it's, it's continuously in there. That day in the distant future isn't next week. It's not, you know, in the next king when the next king comes. It's you. You, you're, you can't even imagine when this day is going to be. It's so far in the future. Now that's chapter six, chapter seven, and through twelve. Chapter seven, Israel turns to Egypt and Assyria. In other words, basically in those chapters seven through twelve, the different places that Israel turns for help are going to be condemned. They're turning to Assyria for help. They're turning to Egypt for help against Assyria. They're turning to idols and altars of sin for help. They're turning everywhere to all their lovers trying to find help and deliverance and none of them are going to be able to help them. You need Yahweh. And yet Yahweh's going to make sure that Assyria doesn't help. Egypt doesn't help. The false gods don't help. Even in chapters 9 and 10, it's going to talk about their prosperity. God is going to bring them into prosperity if it is coming out of Egypt into the land or even in the days of Jeroboam. Remember, Jonah prophesied that there's going to be prosperity during Jeroboam's time. God is going to give them strength. He's going to give them military. He's going to give them trade routes. They're going to have all, the, the economy is going to be booming. Now, what are you going to do with this? We're going to trust in this. You can't, you can't stop this. This is unstoppable. God says, oh my gosh, no. We're going to stop the prosperity. So Egypt will be stopped. Assyria will be stopped. Your false gods will be stopped. Even the prosperity in your land that I gave you, I'm going to snuff it all out. There's nowhere to turn. I mean, God's basically being very, very cruel to him. You've got nowhere to turn. And then chapter 13 through 14, Israel will be judged here in history. Chapter 14, guess what? Israel will return and be saved in the future. I mean, I mean we've seen, we can see it at least four times, and there's probably throughout the book, lines up with all the other prophets, the now is punishment, the future you're going to be delivered. And that's where we're going to be going through in this book, seeing it. I mean, if you never want to come back, that's what the book is about right there. You've heard it. Go home, read it, and you've got it. Now, the, I want to talk about this, um, the view of, of Hosea and Gomer. Just, and again, so this is back to the introduction. Hosea and Gomer. And you really have to make a decision on this, not, not because it's 
life changing. But if we're going to study the book of Hosea, you're going to have to like rate these, prioritize them. This is this sounds like the best one. This might be an option. These two or three sound ridiculous. Uh, but these are the ideas. What is Hosea and Gomer's relationship? Who are these people? The first of the four is it's a hypothetical marriage. Is it's presented. In this view, there was never a marriage. It was either a vision or a symbolic story or an allegory of some sort. This was believed by the Jews in the Middle Ages. It was held on to into the 1800s. That Hosea, this, this doesn't even make sense. I mean, you understand how offensive this can be to Jews. You've got one of your prophets marrying a prostitute. And God telling Hosea, go back to the prostitute and bring her back into your house. It's like, he didn't mean that. He's, it's an illustration. Can you imagine how Christians can't handle this? It's like, uh, no, he would never. This, this can't be. Uh, so that, that, that's that's their logic. In a point C, it's supported because God would never allow or cause or use such an immoral marriage. Maybe as an illustration, but not really. He's never going to put he's never going to put a man through something like that. But he'll do that something to Job. He'll put, you know, Abraham, he'll put his son Jesus through. It's like, uh, you know, but that's what, again, that's in support of that idea. Uh, it's logical, if you want support for it, because Hosea's ministry would have been destroyed by immorality. Meaning, uh, who are you? Oh, I'm a prophet or I'm a preacher in your church. Uh, but yeah, this is my wife, the prostitute. Maybe you guys know her, yeah. Uh, but hey, we, we're living, this is God's will for our life. God spoke to me, says, you know, uh, that's, that's where it's like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not going to get very far in the church ministry with that kind of a message. And so they say that's the way it would have been for Hosea. Uh, the, and, they, and the argument, which is uh, not really an argument, the time between the birth of the children would have been too disconnected to have any meaning. And we already I talked about that. But for some people, that's a stumbling block because you've got you know, the, the first year of marriage, then you're going to have a two-year break, a two-year break, you at least seven years. And who's keeping up with the names of these kids? Uh, and so they think that's, that means it can't be true. It has to just be, it's a story, like you read a storybook. It's not really happening. You can read this in like 10 minutes, but you have to watch it take place in the tabloids for seven years. And they say, no one would pay attention that long. Well, we've watched people in tabloids for an entire lifetime. And so they could keep up with Hosea in a seven-year period, especially if he's got a ministry. Remember, he may have a ministry of 50 years, and we're talking about seven years that kind of lays the foundation for his message. And they would always be able to remember, he knows what he's talking about. He did this very thing where his wife forsook him and he went back and got her. God is going to do that for us. But before he does this, because that's throughout the book, God will come get you. God will come get you. God will come get you. But right now, he doesn't know you. You're not his people. He's not going to forgive you. He's going to judge you. Uh, and it's going to be in the distant future he's going to come get you. Hosea came and got his wife after a few months. God will come and get you after a few millenniums. Uh, this view is rejected, and I would reject this view, the hypothetical marriage view. This book is not written like an allegory. It's written like history. Gomer seems to be a real person. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got the name. Uh, Gomer, the daughter of Diblium. I mean, it's like, you've got, why, you, for the Baxter, you've got to have a name of a father for an allegory. You, it, it's, this is a real, you've got how much, in chapter 3, how much he paid to get her back. Uh, uh, 15 shekels of, of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. It's like, none of these things have any, like, if this is an allegory and you're giving that kind of detail, the price that he's paying, Okay, what does this mean? What is 15 shekels of silver represent? If it's an allegory, it better represent something if you're going to put it in the story. But if it's just a fact, this is what he paid to get her back, it's like, it's just historical information he went and paid for her. If in anything, you can find it, it's historically accurate that that's what you'd pay. So again, there's too many details uh, in here, and that's point three. Uh, besides Gomer being a real person, there's too many details that have no symbolic meaning and they're yet provided. And then four, why write an allegory in two chapters? Chapter one and chapter three is your allegory of your story about Gomer and, and the children. And then you stick in the middle of it, chapter two, which is what? Just the longest chapter in the book about unfaithful Israel. If this is an allegory, why, why, what's not even written like an allegory? You've lost 
part one and part two of the allegory with this huge chapter two. That's the rejection of it. I reject the first hypothetical marriage. Uh, let's do number three next. Point number three. Uh, spiritual and faithless. I mentioned that already. <coughs> that Gomer was a worshiper of the idols. So, now watch this. She is worshiping idols. She is not worshiping Yahweh. Hosea is a prophet of Yahweh. And he is told to go marry uh, 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 an idol worshiper. And when they talk about a prostitute, uh, the prostitute may have been a professional prostitute, but she may have been a prostitute, a temple prostitute, where you'd worship your God by having sexual relations with one of the temple prostitutes. Very popular religion, uh, by the way. But again, that, that, that's what the Corinthians were doing, the Greeks. All the pagan religions end up worshiping their gods through some kind of sexual activity, and the, 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 the God is represented by the priests or the priestesses that you can then go have intercourse with, and you're actually engaging with your God through these sexual interactions. And so Gomer could have been a temple prostitute. Now, the point for this is, but she wasn't, even if she would, forget the temple prostitute here, just that she was just, she was just a, wasn't a believer. So God is telling Hosea to go out and marry an unfaithful Israelite who worships the, the golden calves instead of Yahweh. Now, one of the critics of that, criticism of that would be, you're having a hard time having, accepting the fact that God tells Hosea to go marry a prostitute, but you're okay with him having to go worship, marry an idol worshiper. So if, he's, if, if Gomer is unfaithful uh, morally, uh, she's unfaithful to Hosea, God would never allow that. But if she's unfaithful to Yahweh, oh, that's not a big deal because it's just idol worship. I mean, you understand that you're unfaithful, which is more unfair. And again, if you want to put this in, in our little natural world, it's like how terrible is it to be un unfaithful to your husband? That's, that's, that's unacceptable. But you know, if you're unfaithful to God, I mean, everybody, everybody has trouble with that. So it's like, which is worse? And that the point here would be, this is worse that he would tell, it's actually worse that God would tell Hosea to go marry an idol worshiper than to tell him to go marry an immoral woman. Because this is a violation of Hosea's relationship, this is a violation of Yahweh's relationship. So, I don't even think the story's talking about that. Israel's been spiritually unfaithful. And again, but that's what that is. It's spiritual unfaithfulness. Uh, this means Gomer was an idol worshiper and didn't follow Yahweh, rejected how is idol... How is an idol for more acceptable than a prostitute? So I reject that one. But that is an option out there that Gomer is just a representation of someone that's spiritually or herself is spiritually. It's a real marriage, but spiritually unfaithful. Now comes the one that we got to choose from probably number two and number four. I've gone with number four. Here's number two. It's a literal marriage, meaning the marriage was real. Uh, Hosea did marry a woman named Gomer. Uh, and Gomer is a prostitute. She is uh, working the streets or she's working the temple. That's a temple prostitute. But Gomer is a prostitute and Hosea proposes to her and they go through the whole wedding and she comes in and becomes his wife. They are married. Hosea married a prostitute. That's, that's the idea. Uh, this is what they say is means when God tells Hosea, Take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. That's the chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 right there. That he, that's go, go find a whore and marry her. Uh, the wife was a prostitute, so the children would then be the children of a prostitute. Now, the law forbids the priest. The priest, a priest, cannot marry a prostitute or an unfaithful woman. Can't, can't marry that. And some would say, well, he can't do that because... Uh, the law forbids it. Well, Jose is not a priest. He's a prophet. Then you got to argue, well, if it's not good enough for a, it's not good enough for a priest, not good enough for a prophet. But not just the point. Priests could do it. I reject this. Others reject this. It's not the most natural way of reading the text. I Meaning, it doesn't say she is a prostitute. It's more like she's got the spirit of a prostitute. She's she's a woman like this with a tendency that's going to go this way. This is this is where she's headed. Again. We'll talk about that in more detail when we get to the verse. 
It is not logical that God would tell a man to marry an unfaithful woman who was a prostitute. So right there, this could be rejected. God would not tell Hosea to go marry a prostitute. Now, that's many people believe that's what happened. I'm going to reject this one for what I've already presented. I'm going to reject this idea that she was a prostitute. I'm going to go with number four, where it is a literal marriage. There was a marriage between Hosea and Gomer. They got married. He proposed her. They went through all the feasts, whatever they did. Gomer was not originally a prostitute and was originally faithful to Hosea. They got married. They had children. Uh, uh, number C, if this is rejected. This marriage and family life would have taken too long to be a spiritual example and science of a prophecy. Uh, that's rejected. That, that's some people rejected that. I say it's acceptable for these four reasons. One, six or seven years of married life is not too long to be an example. Two, Hosea wasn't just playing a part in a prophecy. Hosea loved Gomer. She was a good woman. She was a good wife. They had children. Hosea is in love with Gomer. But uh, she's going to become unfaithful. She's going to become a prostitute. She's going to become unfaithful to him and to her children and go off with another man and other men. She's actually going to end up, so maybe she, maybe she goes after another, who knows? We don't, there's a thousand questions. Maybe she falls in love with another man, which then rejects her, which leads her then to a life of prostitution because she's not living at home. She's not living at home. Jose is not providing for her, so she's now making a living as a prostitute. Now she's in the streets. Now she's trying to, you know, she's, now she's there. She's become, prostitution has something to do with Gomer's life. She is either a prostitute or is going to become a prostitute. She's either is going to become an adulteress or is an adulteress. She's going to be unfaithful morally and sexually to Hosea. So that's where she's at. Um, point three, people, like I've said this already, people would have seen, heard, and known about Hosea's family life and had sympathy on him. They would have had compassion on Hosea and understood his emotions and actions. This would have made the people consider God's feelings and actions towards Israel. It may have caused them to reconsider their treatment of God since they were in reality the Gomer. And then point four, Hosea's experience with Gomer is an exact parallel with Yahweh's experience with Israel throughout the book, throughout history. And so that's why I like to think of Gomer as being uh, a good wife, a good woman, uh, you know, not a prostitute. And then through a series of events, one, two, three children, she drags off and goes into this life. And Hosea is going to come back and get her. He's going to come back and find his wife who has gone into prostitution and bring her back and say, you're going to live with me for many years. And then I would assume, that, again, we would like to know that is that what happened? I mean, I think we're left to believe that they had seven years together. She's leaning and tending towards this prostitution or unfaithless. She goes off the deep end. She's in trouble. He goes and gets her and brings her back, and they live happily forever. He's a, he's a prophet now for the next 40 years, and Gomer is there with him. Uh, their children grow up, live you know, happy lives, whatever. Uh, who knows? Their country falls apart. Uh, the Assyrians burn their house down, and they all run to Judah. Uh, we do not know. We do not know any more than what, what we've read. A lot of these things uh, we've got to assume.